What's up, what's up? Finally, I'm back. Of course, I'm your host, Ricardo Brandes, also known as Ricky Brands, and a great episode for you today. Sorry about the hiatus. It's been a little bit since the last episode. I do have James Corbett coming on right around the corner. Hopefully, you'll be getting that episode soon after this one. And I have a bunch of guests already booked. It just, it's really hard this time of year with coaching soccer and, and basketball and both kids playing multiple sports and, and just been super busy. And then, of course, work having to find family time, friend time, gym time, sports time for myself to play some sports. So yeah, it, it's getting a little difficult, but as work slows down and as the free time increases, I will have more time to get these shows recorded, edited, uploaded, and to you as quickly as possible. But this is a fun discussion with one of the creators of the very popular YouTube channel called The Texas Boys. And then also the host of the Fearless Podcast, TD. And we talk about a lot of different things, our upbringing, our own personal philosophies and stories. We talk about big pharma, big food, homesteading, and much, much more. So this is a fun discussion. I'll have links in the show description to all of TD's websites, podcasts, and much more in the show description. So definitely check that out. And also in the show description, you will find ways of supporting the show. Of course, I have to remind you, this is a value for value show. If you get any value out of these discussions that I bring to you, please consider giving some value back. Of course, it doesn't have to be financial. You can rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show on all the many platforms I'm on. I'm on a bunch of them. I'm on Band.Video. I'm on Rumble, Rockfin, BitChute, Minds, and many others. Also, follow me on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook. Join our Telegram group chat which are all great options if you want to keep up with my latest work, but also maybe keep up with just my personal life, see pictures of the family, see what I'm up to, see how the kids are doing in regards to sports, car shows, and many other things that I occupy my time with. But if you are in a good financial situation, please consider giving some value back financially. There's plenty of ways to doing so. First, you can check out the merch store. I have some new logos that were just released that I'm really, really excited about. Ryan from the Independent Review Podcast and also the small business owner of Big Frog Merch is helping me out and putting out some amazing designs and helping me with so many just cool things that are coming out. So definitely check out the Ripple Effect Podcast Merch.com to go directly to that merch store and get some merch. Hoodie season is right around the corner, so get yourself some hoodies. Check out the new logos and new designs. Support a show that you like and get some cool stuff because the print on his stuff is phenomenal. It looks awesome. The quality of the clothes is second to none. I can't be any happier with just the quality of the Ripple Effect Podcast merch. So definitely check out the Ripple Effect Podcast merch.com to go directly there. Or you can go to the Ripple Effect Podcast.com and find all my links for everything. So you will also find links to my Patreon page if you want to support me monthly. And thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, all you Patreon supporters that have stuck with the show consistently support me every month even when it's taken a little bit longer than normal to get out shows i really really appreciate it i truly believe that if a small percentage of people watch and listen to the ripple effect podcast also donated even just a dollar monthly on patreon i could easily do the show full time so thank you everyone who has and please everyone who hasn't yet please consider doing so let's be honest most of us wouldn't even notice if we're supporting a show with as little as a dollar a month. And it would be a life changer if a small percentage of you guys did it to support the Ripple Effect podcast. I hope that you guys enjoy the show enough to at least consider it. But of course, there's other ways you can support the show. You can send a one-time donation via PayPal, Venmo. You can send some crypto 
And of course, all these links will be in the show description or on my website, RippleEffectPodcast.com. I also have a YouTube channel if you want to check out the clips. It's most of the clips that I'm also sharing on TikTok, but on TikTok, they're censoring me much more than YouTube, weirdly enough. So there'll be a couple extra clips of old great past guests on YouTube that you can't find on TikTok. So please subscribe there and also find the documentary playlist where you can find tons of interesting documentaries that are still on YouTube, but who knows how much longer they're going to be on there. And also, before I forget, shout out to Content Safe. Of course, I always have to remind you guys that they're the reason why you can find the Ripple Effect podcast on so many different video platforms. I upload to one platform and then magically it appears on all these other platforms. So thank you to guys at Content Safe for helping me out get these shows to all the alternative video platforms. And of course, if you're a content creator, podcaster, YouTuber, or anything like that, any type of content creator, and you want to expand to all these other platforms, but you don't have the time to upload, check out Matt from Content Safe. Let him know you're a listener to Ripple Effect Podcast, and he'll definitely take care of you. That's it, guys. Enjoy this amazing conversation. Hopefully, the next one will be out much sooner, and I will talk to you guys next time. Glad we can make it happen. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. This is kind of uh I'm a I'm a little bit of a like a fanboy, so I don't want to lie or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get it. Well, you know what? Maybe uh we'll learn a little bit more about how you ran into my show in sharing your story and how sure every I mean, I guess you can start as far back as you would like. Um, I believe Scott hooked us up, right? Uh, yes, yep. Yeah, from uh, the Rebunk News and a bunch of other things. He he stays busy, so he's involved in a lot of different projects, Unjected, and he's helping now with Grand Theft World and and many other things. So, um, but yeah, let's uh let's start right from your origin story. Let's find out where you grew up, uh, your upbringing, any influences, inspirations you've had along the way, uh, and let's just get to know you. Sure. So, you know, I grew up in the Northeast, like in the Philly area. And, um, grew up in a Christian home and, you know, did all the stuff, went to government school and I kind of survived that and then didn't quite know what I wanted to do with my life. So I did what everybody's supposed to do. You know, you go to school to get a good education so you can get a good job and all that stuff. So went to, uh, paid my own way. So went to community college. And then in community college, I met my wife and then we transferred, uh, we transferred to state school and she, uh, she was completing her major. And when she graduated, I had been in school now for like, I don't know, seven or eight years or whatever. And I said, you know, I'm kind of done. I'm, I'm tired of paying tuition and all this stuff. And so, uh, you know, we got married, bought a house we had a couple kids and the state of affairs, uh, I was originally in the financial industry and I was financial planner for 11 years. And so I was actively working when the dot com bubble popped. And then also when the 08 crash happened and I was seeing really weird stuff in the financial markets, as far as the fiscal chicanery of the large firms and even, you know, stuff like Fidelity and American funds inside of these fund families. I was watching lots of really shady things going on. And uh, I was like, you know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And as God would have it, I kind of got forced out of a practice and uh, took took a big financial hit. It was right before uh, our third son was born. It was the week before he was born and the week before Christmas. And, uh, so I kind of reinvented myself, started, uh, general contracting. So doing some general con- construction work and, um, developed that did well. And then it was probably like 13 years ago, we had, um, some straight line wins and it knocked out the power for like an extended period of time for like seven or eight days. And it was a large outage. So like, uh, uh, gas stations didn't have power. And I observed some 
insane social interactions with people that just lost their mind just because they couldn't get uh, gas at the gas station. And the fascinating thing is there was, there was these really long gas lines and it was a, it was a, uh, it was a four lane um, interstate with a, with a concrete median. And so we're, we're fueling it up for my guys there on the job site. And like, most employees, they have like the mentality of a fifth grader and they don't like put gas in their vans and stuff. So like we're, we're at the job site and, uh, my main guy was like, Hey man, I don't have gas in my van. I don't think I can get home. So I'm like, well, I'll go get you gas thinking like, yeah, what's the big deal? I go get gas. So we start driving and there, and we finally find a gas station with power and, uh, <laughs> and there's this insane line. And so we get in line and it is, it is, it is bedlam. Everybody's losing their mind and just acting insane. We fill up a little five gallon can and I, I had to make a right going out to go, to go North. And the next gas station we come to is virtually empty. So like there was all this hysteria and bedlam and nobody thought to like, well, let me just drive to the next gas station. Right. And I was like, so that was like a wake up call for me. And I remember coming home that day, talking to my wife and I'm like, we should reconsider like our entire life strategy. I, I think, um, that, you know, not that insanity is exclusive to a region or anything, but I was like, we should really consider. So we started talking about redesigning our life and living a slower, more simplified life and a, a more intentional life. And we were doing lots of research. We homeschool. And we're big um, constitutionalists. And and so we started doing some research on states like, well, where should we move and all this stuff? And our research brought us to Oklahoma and Texas. And um, we had planned a trip to Oklahoma, to Norman, Oklahoma. And we were going to vacation there a week. Uh, the week after Norman got leveled by that like Cat 5 tornado. And uh, so I'm like, well, I don't think we're going to do that anymore. Um, so let's start thinking about Texas cause the tornado thing really kind of spooked my wife and everything. So long story short, we had a five year game plan to move to Texas that kind of got expedited by a very long story. And so we packed up our stuff. We packed up all of our stuff that would fit in an eight by 12 one way U-Haul and we moved to Texas. We didn't know anybody. We had never been to Texas. Uh, we didn't have any contacts in Texas. And we kind of landed. And we, 10 years ago, we rebuilt our life. And uh, Joel Salton talks about this homestead tsunami, you know, that's occurring. And I think we were that initial maybe earthquake or shock wave. We were in that first wave of like homesteaders, people just, people that were interested in their own food and you know, we're health conscious and we had all different kinds of issues and ailments and whatnot. And we're like, and we wanted to raise our kids differently and have them connected to their food and different things. So, um, yeah, we moved to Texas 10 years ago. And then, uh, that started this kind of like whole homestead idea. We, we had, my wife, uh, showed horses and all that stuff. So she was very, uh, used to animals and we had had goats and chickens uh before we moved and so we just decided to scale that uh when we moved we had three young boys and um so we just kind of started doing this homestead thing and we were watching all these content creators and reading everything we can about you know food and regenerative agriculture and all that stuff so we we're like you know this would be a great uh tool one to feed ourselves but two to kind of train our children give them responsibilities and uh, be, because uh, one thing that I have learned and I didn't initially think of it this way, but I grew up very uh, white collar, blue collar, no collar, dirty collar kind of. And we were, unbeknownst to me, we were relatively poor um, from a socioeconomic class and having been successful in different things, I'm like, how are we going to, how are we going to raise our kids hard? You know, how are they going to understand the value of a dollar and the hustle and all these different things that it takes? And from my, from our experience, uh, a, this, this agrarian 
agricultural, um, slower lifestyle really gives you all of those components so that you can assign your, your kids chores and they have these responsibilities for other animals and for the food production and the process and different things that it's the, a great tool to raise your children in a way where you're creating, um, they were raised in a way that even though we, we had, we have had a lot of success and we're, we're now well off financially. When, we, when we moved 10 years ago, uh, I had to ditch my business and ditch everything. They had to foreclose on my house. So it destroyed my credit score. And we started with about 70,000 in cash and we had to buy a fixer upper and start from scratch. So when we, when we hit the reset button on this life, it reset everything. Um, and we, we didn't have any capital. I didn't have any credit and we had to rebuild all this and we did it, um, with inclusion of our children, our children were all, all part of that process. And that shifted our mindset again about not just living a slower, more intentional life, but living a living legacy where if we can do these things and, you know, um, com communally, like they still do these things in Europe, you know, these family type properties and family type homesteads where it's inclusive of the family and it's inclusive, you know, multi-generational and not just multi-generational, but simultaneously multi-generational where the family has a little place and then the children have their own little place and they're all working together. So it's been a, like a really, uh, a really long-term dream of ours that's continued to develop and foster. And here we are now, 10, 11 years in, and my oldest son is building his house right next door. Um, he's getting ready to get married and, and we're watching kind of like that next phase. And it's, it's really neat how, when you just kind of step out on faith and do what you know that you need to do and watch it come to fruition. Mean, meanwhile, the world is like melting around us. It's like, it's like disintegrating and, you know, everybody's asking the question, well, one, how did we get here? But like, how do we, how do we get back? Like, how do we bring any of this back into any type of normalcy or balance? And, um, it, the peculiar part of it is with our life and lifestyle and being very rural and out in the country and living a much slower paced life. Like if we didn't want to venture out and be more involved and weren't, if we weren't involved on social media, we, we could very easily kind of like unplug and be in our own little paradise, which I, which I don't think is right. I mean, the, the thing is, is if you want, if you're trying to develop a living legacy and an integrated legacy with your family, you know, there's certain foundational fundamental things that you want to maintain in place that can disintegrate around you. And if you're unplugged, you know, you're, you're completely unaware of the freedoms that are being stolen and the the bureaucratic um, hijacking of basically what folks call the technocratic oligarchy. So, but living this slower intentional life, we do want to be advocates for this way of life to try to maintain it, foster it, um, advance it so that others can kind of plug into not really a model, but just kind of um, see the value in it and see the fruit of it and say, yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And I think we should try it. Yeah. Uh, um, obviously you are a listener of this podcast. Cause you know, if you do stop talking, I'll start talking and then I'll do too much talking. So I'm glad you actually, cause that's a, the, the listeners complain always. Is that <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of things I want to hit on one. It, it's that, that thing about when you see another side of people is so true. Um, obviously we saw it during COVID prior to COVID some years ago in Massachusetts, as many of you guys know, I live in Massachusetts, unfortunately. And, uh, it was like an October storm that we, we got, it was like, 
I think it was late October. We got a bunch of snow. It was like a freak thing never happens. And you don't even think much of it. You don't think it's going to cause some huge issues because it's New England. We get snow all the time. But what happened was the leaves were still on the trees. So it caused all this extra weight on the branches. And then it led to these branches falling. Well, we had like just everybody in the state lost power. It was like, there was no power anywhere. There was like a handful of places that had power. Um, there's huge lines um, at gas stations. There's huge lines at um, at uh, restaurants that were open that didn't uh, lose power for, you know, there's a, a handful of places that survived uh, the, the, uh, the emergency and the issues. And it, it just, you were seeing like just people like butting heads, people being impatient, people uh, stop being, so helpful to others and more concerned about themselves right and you, and then it kind of reminded me i'm like dude if there was a zombie apocalypse if there was some type mm. of you know crazy emergency like a lot of people you think you're friends with would turn on you in a heartbeat you know and it kind of you know it felt like a zombie apocalypse like it was just silent there was like no cars on the road there was um you know nobody everybody was like kind of freaking out a little bit and there's this sense of like just i don't know just like uh a panic some uh energy this panic energy and little did i know that i was going to feel that again during covid but mm -hmm. it, it was uh it, it really made me rethink like a lot of things like much like yourself where you start thinking about like wow if, if stuff you know everybody's really like there's all this order right and you always hear jordan peterson talk about order and chaos and whatnot there's all this order but it wouldn't take a lot for that order to turn into chaos, right? One one little event, one little thing, and all of a sudden you see other sides of people. And I also love your story. And uh, of course, you know, if you listen to Ripple Effect podcast, like I I can relate to a lot of your upbringing because I was born in a house uh, with no running water where my parents, I mean, I didn't grow up there. I, um, you know, I was born there. My parents came to America as immigrants, as Portuguese immigrants. Um, when I was four, we migrated here and, uh, you know, and of like legal immigrants, uh, they had to have sponsors and they had to have, um, you know, uh, somebody who was going to employ them. So and then they could prove that they were going to contribute in a positive way to this country. And um, and they came here and, and they worked their, you know, their ass off. And um, and it, it's it's funny because they they kind of went in reverse a little bit than your story because they went from farmers. You know, um, you know, I, I remember going back to Portugal, we'd go back every summer and they grew up on a farm. My dad was one of twelve. My mom is was one of uh, of seven, and huge families. They and they all lived on this farm. And each kid was like just another free, you know, employee. You know, because they all contributed a little bit. Because mm -hmm. I remember having this conversation with my parents and and being like, "How could you, you know, your your how could my grandparents uh, handle that many kids?" And he's like, "Well, everybody helped out. That the older siblings took care of the younger siblings, which made them." mature a little uh sooner too because you you were learning responsibility uh and also everybody worked on the farms like my, my parents didn't go to school for long because at a certain age they had to travel to go to school so they were given the the choice to stay um working on the farm stay stay at home work on the farm and and start working with i guess for lack of a better term the family business or you could travel and continue going to school well, no kid's going to say, I want to continue going to school, or at least most kids won't. So that most of them just quit school and, and just worked on the farm. But and then they came here and I've, I've told a story on the show before. So I apologize if people have heard it. But I remember being a kid one day uh, and hearing my dad complain about about like just his life in America. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, dude, you have a house. You, you know that you know an actual house that's in good condition you know not not that house that we that they grew up in portugal where like wood was rotting and you know and didn't have any you know they didn't have a tv they didn't have a bathroom they didn't have any of these things um and i'm like you have a car you, you didn't have that in portugal so like to me as a kid i'm like you have all these things like you're way better off and then as i got older and i started kind of reflecting on what he meant by that uh, it hit me. I'm like, we go back to Portugal. They don't have those material things, but everybody is happy. Like every time I go to every, all my experiences of going back and we're from up north. Uh, I was born in Shavs, but we're from like a, a small village uh, outside of Shavs. And uh, 
And we would go back and like one, everybody was related. Like everybody's your cousin because there's just everybody kind of just dated and married within the community. And, um, and so, and everybody was friendly. Everybody seemed to be in a good mood. And then I come to know, you know, you look at America and like everybody's stressed. There is no gathering except you're, you know, when you're forced to on a holiday, when, you know, it's like, well, we have to get together for Christmas. We have to get, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and there's so, and then I'm like, have we been tricked? And I remember in one of my uh, early songs, I called it like the sabotage, like American dream or something along those lines, where it's just like, you know, they kind of trick you into believing like, hey, this is the dream. But then you sacrifice all these other things and then you, you're self-medicating with with alcohol or drugs or whatever or porn or whatever you're tr you're doing to kind of keep yourself um, happy and, and, and satisfied when when maybe you had it right all along and what you left behind was the most important things. And that was community and whatnot. And, you know, what, what's your thoughts on all that? I, I think you're spot on. I mean, and that's kind of my point of this living legacy idea where, you know, one thing that I've always said from a business perspective, and I still work si outside of the home and everything is the next uh, crisis is going to be the employee crisis. And that isn't a reference to automation nation and them trying to outsource all of us, but it's a reference to this current generation and their time blindness and all these other things and all this uh, DEI and CRT and all that stuff. Um, whereas is if you're developing a familial community with children and then they get married and have children and different things, you're kind of baking in, just like you were talking about, you're baking in the infrastructure and the help and the hands to make these things um profitable to the point where they can exist without exterior inputs. And that's really, you know, I bet you if you went back and talked to your dad, right, they saw, oh, America is the land of opportunity. And that opportunity is comprised of uh, moving into a neighborhood, rejecting, rejecting our historical lifestyle, right? And then moving into this more modern, industrialized um, cul-de-sac, you know, and, and maybe I could get like an office job or something that's not as menial as digging a ditch or whatever, um, something that's not manual labor, maybe something that at one point in time had a pension, even though they've dissolved all that stuff, um, you know, and and I think that that was just like you were saying, that was part of the trick was move to America, become American, be industrialized, live in a neighborhood. Not that there, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but you lose sight of the value of a slower agrarian type lifestyle where you're in connection with your food. Now, 10 years ago, right? Well, what's the big deal about being connected to your food and food so readily available and there are some organic sources and we can do all these things right and then COVID happens the supply chain collapses right and now and they're systematically poisoning the air they're systematically po poisoning the soil they're poisoning everything um if there are any decent products out there this monolithic mega corporation is like gobbling them up with these tarp dollars and these covid dollars and these huge monolithic structures are becoming more monolithic and they can like for example um bragg's vinegar with the mother right so bragg's got bought out by one of these venture capital companies and now everybody's like Bragg's is garbage. It's it's not good anymore. And then just last week, there was this one brand of, uh, there was this chip company that doesn't use seed oils, and they just got bought out last week by PepsiCo for one point two billion. And see, this is part of this systematic destruction of our food system. So, what's the solution to that? Is is to be actively involved in your food process, whether it's raising. Something interesting that's happened to us in the past two years due to continual, I have an arthritic condition in my shoulder. And so we went carnivore and I know you're keto or whatever. And um, this is just another cog in that machine where, uh, you know, we started raising our own cows and 
we have a, a local microprocessor and it's it's so neat when there's these issues with the food infrastructure and they're like yeah but we've been kind of working towards this um not not thinking that the entire world was going to concave on itself but um we've been working at this and we have a couple cows and we're good and uh, we're building our community we're keeping our money in in our community not just in the family but at the local processor so when we spend our dollars it's multiplied by about seven because instead of outsourcing our dollars to walmart that sends all of our money to china you know this when you consider a holistic agrarian lifestyle, you are solving so many problems that you're not even aware that exist until these there's more holes in the dam that continue to pop and buckle. And um, it's very satisfying. And that's and this is what's really kind of interesting about our story is um, about nine years ago or so, my boys were really young. And they went to their mom and they were like, mom, we want to have a YouTube channel. It's like a hobby, right? They're like, we want to have a YouTube channel and kind of document what we're doing, all the crazy stuff. And so they started that and it kind of evolved and grew. And then we got hit with the censorship and all this stuff for weird, benign, basic stuff. And, um, but it's always been my intention to keep that going on, on, uh, as a social media presence as an example and an illustration of, look, these principles work. This lifestyle works if you decide to work it. Um, this is an opportunity as an, uh, a learning tool um, to teach and train your children, to give them responsibilities, help them to grow hard. And the synergy out of all that and the beauty out of all of that is we're creating our own food um, now we have enough abundance where we're actually selling our beef locally, you know, and then due to all the YouTube nonsense, we started a website and we started selling our own products and like we have a new organic coffee line and all these neat different things that just continue. And, and this is where the, all the other agendas 2030 and all these other things where we want to educate and make people aware to push back because, America used to be capitalist and what's completely the, that word capitalism and capitalist keeps getting thrown around. Right. But people ignore the, the base root of the word capital. Right. So it, we, we are in a debt based economy. We're in a debt based society. We're in a debt based um, investment market. It's completely anti-capitalist. There is no capital. Capital is savings. Right. Capital is you accumulate um, savings and then you capitalize that savings. That that concept is completely gone, which is and without that concept of capital and savings, you will always have these insane boom and bust cycles. You have all these bubble on bubble on bubble because there's no reserve. There's no capital. It's all debt based and we'll print our way out of it. Well, except with taxes, you know, we we'll always have to tax you more. We can't prick. We can't print tax money. We can print like genocide billions to send to Gaza and to send to Ukraine. But I mean, when people in um, uh, Carolina, I mean, when people in Tennessee need money, you know, we'll send them 750 bucks that they'll have to pay back because, you know, we don't have any money to help our people. And we can't, po I mean, we can't possibly print money then because then it would just increase the deficit, right? But, but, oh, but we are sending another 150 um, million dollars to Lebanon on a new proxy war that we're starting over there. And, and th these are all these, and what is that? That's, that's synthetic. It's artificial. It's, it's this banker control and it is, it's this modern philosophy of, well, you know, you, you go to school, you get a good job, um, you need tax breaks. So you invest in a 401k so you can put money in an account and send it to BlackRock and Vanguard and uh, State Street and all of these, uh, all of these people that are absconding all of your wealth. You can send it there because you need to get a 12% rate of return. Why? Because of hyperinflation. Why is there hyperinflation? Oh, well, they've overprinted the money supply, you know? And it, it it's so void of capitalism. And, you know, that's what we try to teach our kids. We try to teach our kids to save. 
right? And that, and what we're trying to implement is something called private family banking, where we are actually financing all of our own projects within the family, right? And this is, this isn't a new concept. This is an ancient concept that they continue to use overseas. You know, you see it with immigrant families where they pool their money and well, my uncle, he's a mason, so he's going to do all the brickwork. My other uncle, he's a plumber, so I'm going to pay him to do the plumbing, right? And and these families pool their money, and they keep it in the family. And it's the same idea of keeping the money in your community, not using these, you know, the Walmarts of the world and all of these other mega stores that are just, they're taking our dollars and they're shipping them everywhere. And meanwhile, Blackstone, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, they continue to monolithic, make everything more monolithic. And, you know, you're, you're financing your own prison. And it, the craziest thing is, right. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. 10 years, you just wanted to go, you just wanted to raise chickens, right? Like you just wanted a slower life to like raise chickens and maybe raise cows and to know that you're eating healthy food. But in so doing, as you create these uh, microcosms of economy, we can actually, we can do this. We can rebuild and we can structure our lives in such a way where we're adding value to the family unit, right? What, what do they want to do? Well, dissolve the family unit, destroy the patriarchy. Everybody will be androgynous. Nobody will know uh, what gender they are and we'll all be fluid and we'll all become one and we'll be the Borg and you'll have basic universal income. And so you won't have to worry about making money. You won't have to worry about saving money. And the end game is like complete and total panopticon control where you will you own nothing and somehow you're happy. Yeah, I have Muslim friends and they they all live together till they, you know, they get married. And sometimes even when they're married, they still all live together and they all financially support one another and they all invest in the house and help each other. So you don't have that burden of like, I'm struggling to make ends meet because if everybody contributes to one house instead of everybody contributing to their own house, it's much easier to sur survive. And this whole, again, back to that American dream of like getting your own house in, in the suburb. And if you go to the history of the suburb, I think it was um, Douglas Ruskoff when he was on the show years ago, he brought this up uh, on the show about uh, it was like a... Long Island, uh, what was it? It was in Long Island. It was like the first suburb, first American suburb built. Uh, and he he tend to believe that it was kind of designed for, and it makes sense. It was kind of designed to not have community, to not have people talk to one another, to not have people share lettuce with tomatoes and what, you know, like I, you have a lawnmower, I have a weed whacker. I let you borrow my weed whacker. I borrow your lawnmower, like that type of thing. I have tomatoes, you have peaches. We, you know, we share with one another. It's like, it forces everybody to have to go to the, to the grocery store and be dependent on the system. And, and it kind of makes sense. And that's kind of the path that we're going. Um, you know, it, it's funny. Cause I always go back and forth with this, like universal basic, uh, income thing. It's like, I do want to help the weakest link because I'm like, I don't want people to be so poor and homeless. And a lot of times it's it's not fault of their own. They're they're kind of, like you said, born into this debt uh, base world where it's like, hey, we've convinced you to go to college and uh, and spend mil you know uh, thousands of dollars um, to to get a job that might not even be there when you're done with college. And and you're just stuck at that, you know, uh, just unfulfilling job forever it, because now you have this giant bill that you have to pay off and if you file for bankruptcy it's the one uh debt that doesn't go away so you you'll owe us for life and you know so you, you're kind of stuck in the system and then what happens like you do end up you know now you're depressed now the pharmaceutical industry says here take this pill and it's just like so this is endless cycle of like just ruining you from the start and and of course the brainwashing that happens at school and, and whatnot uh all the unschooling that's kind of uh, uh required just to make sure your kid uh you know doesn't question what gender he is at six <laughs> you know like <laughs> but you know it's just one of those things where like i i you know in a perfect world i could see it a a world where like okay 
if people weren't, you know, if they had the necessities, if they had like just enough money to kind of, you know, pay for food and, and the necessities, maybe we would be better off. But the problem is like, who controls that, right? It's going to be the exactly who, who says, Hey, you want this money to, to pay for your food? Um, you know, that, that means like, maybe you need to be vaccinated. Maybe that, maybe you need to, you know, so it's like all these, and we saw that happen during the, you know, the, the COVID where it's just like, just for people to go to work and make ends meet, they, they had to show a vaccine card or whatnot. So, it, you know, that's the, I think, you know, the problem with a lot of people is like, yeah, in theory, a lot of things seem like it'd be a great thing, but when you put it into practice, all the flaws in that theory get exposed. And then also you can't, you can't, you, you can't ignore the fact that there's corruption in, in everything. Like I always yeah. union uh, and you're a contractor, you're right. So I've been in the construction world for a long time um, because right out of high school, a lot of it, Portuguese immigrants, when they came to America, um, there's a few, a handful of construction companies in, in uh, you know, the area that we're from. And, uh, in Western Massachusetts. So, and then a lot of the foreigners end up coming and working construction because it was something that didn't really require much understanding or, or, um, or education in regards to the English language. So they got in, they could make, you know, a decent living. They could raise a family off that salary. So my, I grew up kind of always around it. And even the town that I live in has tons of construction companies. Everybody kind of works construction and you, you see with unions, in theory, it was a, it was a great idea. During the Industrial Revolution, you had all these uh, you know capitalists that were making tons of profit and not sharing any of the wealth. Right? They were just yeah. ruining everybody. They were working a lot, making very little, and you know people like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and everybody's getting rich, and they the rest uh, were, were getting screwed. And then so you yeah in unions in in theory, great idea. Like let's unionize, let's force them. Like if if we have no other. Uh, authority or power over these these companies like let's you uh, gather and force them to have to give us better wages and and time off and whatever and now you know present day comes and you could probably google the head of any union and find some scandal related to them find yeah. some corruption story find some i mean we've been um you know we're a small little contractor and if we we uh, work close to, uh, we're from Ludlow, Massachusetts, a, a town outside of Springfield, Massachusetts, where the Basketball Hall of Fame is. And we work, you know, this area, but sometimes we travel to the Berkshires, more west. And sometimes we travel more east towards Worcester, Boston. And you go in different territories, even though our employees are union, we'll get a business manager that shows up and says, hey, you need to employ one of our contractors. And we're like, um, all our guys are union. Like we're not, we're not trying to pull a fast one. Like our guys are, and I, for people listening, they might not know how, how, how mafia esque this, this mm -hmm. gets really quickly. Oh, it's not mafia esque. It is mafia. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good point. So they end up going, you know, and saying, Hey, you have to hire one of our, uh, uh guys. And I'm like, well, you know, your guys are in the labor's union. Our guys are in the labor's union. Like, why Why do we have to hire one of your guys just to keep you happy? But that's how it works. Like, we, our options are either we lay off a loyal employee who is probably going to find work somewhere else, or we just deal with the fact we have to pay one of their guys to show up every day just to keep them off our case. So yeah. that's what ends up happening. So your profit margin, which is slim to none already, is become like even smaller and you hire a guy d just to show up. And th guess what? That employee knows he's, he's there just to keep them off your case. So mm -hmm. guess how much motivation they have to work? Very little <laughs> to none. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, that type of thing, we had a, a issue and, and this might be boring to some people, but um, it, it might not, but we had an issue where we had, we had, uh, we had a uh, operators union, representative show up to a job saying like, Hey, you know, like, do you need an operator? And I'm like, Oh, actually at the moment, we kind of actually could use one if you, if you have a decent one. So we hire this operator first day on the job. He, um, accidentally hits the joystick getting in or out of, uh, our machine smashes a truck, almost kills oh. one of our laborers. And I'm just, so of course I call 
the 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 uh, representative i'm like hey this guy needs to like get off our site like he's he's gonna kill somebody he doesn't know how to use these machines he's he's awful i'm like n nothing personal but i'm like we just need to and and the, the business manager goes well you know the rules um if if he if you send him home it's because that machine has no more work I'm like, well, send me somebody else. They're like, we we don't have anybody else. And I'm I'm just like, wait, wait. So my options now are if I send him home, I can't use that machine. That's like literally the rules. I cannot use that machine. Yeah. So I, we we're forced to have to send him home. And we had to uh, bring in another little machine that wasn't exactly what we wanted or, or wasn't really efficient. But just to keep them off our case. But all these little stories, it's just like, this is the way it's run. Like, this is the truth about unions. They, they in some case, I mean, maybe Amazon does need a union. I don't know. Maybe the UFC really needs a union. I don't, but it, there's so, like, it's not black or white. It isn't, they're always good or they're always bad. And, and people, you know, it, what happens is it becomes very cult like where, I will talk to people and like if they grew up like their dads, you know, retired from the union, they're in the union, you know, and it's like they do not see any issues with the way they do things, even though it's quite obvious bullying. Like you're you're being yeah. a the smaller contractors and, and you do it and you have no problem doing it. I mean, you go towards Boston, they will vandalize your equipment and yeah. I'm hopefully nobody in the union listens to this podcast, but uh, they will. You know, they, they will. will very friendly with me um they they will vandalize your equipment you will show up the next day you will have you know your tires pop you'll have i mean even yeah. if you're a small contractor they could care less they could care yeah. less i mean have you have you dealt with any issues like that before i've i've dealt with i've dealt with the unions in the past and the way that i've always viewed it and we had to do the same thing you have to hire a warm body you know and you have to pay the rates and really they just want to get their money and what I've experienced with unions is, you know, oh, yeah, be part of the union and uh, you'll get this huge hourly rate. And really, uh, unemployment is just a union scheme, right? Because they hire these guys at double what they should be making, right? And these guys will work four to five months out of the year and then see, look, now we're going to have to lay you off. But since you're at such a high rate, when you look at your unemployment rate, your, your cumulative average rate is still going to be very high. So really all it is is a, a government scheme to subsidize their employees that will get huge swaths of time off while they're still getting paid unemployment at their hyperinflated rate. And, and you're just watching that public-private partnership. You're watching the government and the unions in bed together, and it's a, it's just a gigantic money scheme. And just like you were saying, oh, does Amazon or the UFC need a union? Well, what we have learned from history is all it will be is a power grab. Even if it starts with the best intentions with great people, they will all get weeded out, right? And it'll be some mob boss or somebody's cousin, and he'll end up at the top, you know, and he'll have his uh, knuckle breakers and the guy that hits, the, hits you in the knees with a sledgehammer, and they'll have their collectors, they'll have... and. That's something fascinating that I think historically everybody thinks like, oh, yeah, well, the mob, it, you know, got destroyed and disappeared. The mob, the mafia is very real. Uh, many of them work in the district of criminals. Um, they still do waste management and all these other things, and they're still alive and well. And they the the government and the mafia have merged and it's the same thing. It's the same thing in other countries as well. And, you know, that's why historically somebody could raise a question, uh, well, does Amazon need a union? Well, it'll just be an exploitation of workers. It'll be a surcharge. It'll be an overcharge. It will exclusively be abused because I can't historically think of a scenario where it hasn't been, you know, and once again, it's the deconstruction of free enterprise, of capitalism, of allowing free markets to operate, of opportunity, a meritocracy. Well, bring your value to the market, bring your skill set to the market, bring your hustle to the market, right? And the market, if not encumbered by government or bureaucracy, will reward you and make a place for you, and you can thrive and succeed and then, and then the market's going to throw you all kind of curveballs, and then you're going to have to not just bring value to the market, but bring solutions even to your own enterprise to continue to work around 
all of the bureaucracy and the technocracy and the censorship that can will just continue to attack and destroy free free market capitalism without a doubt and and that's the the concerning thing is that you know again in theory a lot of things seem like you can debate them and they that you know but when you put them into practice and, and just give it a try. Google any union. Like there's scandals up to yin yang with every union. Like there, there's people stealing money. There's people, you know, doing this. To, you know, um, there's just corruption. There's tons of union rep representatives and presidents and VPs who've been arrested and been locked up. I mean, it just it's a history. And again, like you said, the UFC, Amazon, same thing will happen eventually. In time, somebody's going to be like, well, let's pinch some more money and put it in our pocket. And really, it's just like because we, we live in a debt-based system, how much of it's really just like, hey, because we've taught you not to save, we'll save some of it for you. You know, it's basically exactly. right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you're outsourcing. You know, it's like uh, you're a child and you must be cared for. So, you know, we'll, we'll provide you with a pension or we'll provide you with a 401k. We'll provide you with a match. And meanwhile, just like with all these retirement schemes, like we're going to isolate this money. We're going to put it in a tax deferred account. Oh, how do we get tax deferred status? Oh, well, we, we work in consortium with the government and the government promises you this carrot to like, oh, in order to save your money, you need to get the rate of return to outpace hyperinflation and all these other things. So it needs to go into the market. This way, BlackRock, Vanguard, Blackstone, this way they all have access to your money. And oh, conveniently enough, you don't have access to your money, you know, because you're saving it for your retirement. And Currently, you're getting this tax break at the current at your current tax rate, right? Which we absolutely know for an absolute certainty, you will be in a higher tax bracket when you retire, whether you like it or not, even if you're eating like dog food, right? Because they're just going to continue to tax, tax, tax. They'll never stop printing, right? So the 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 point and the solution for that is control to control your own money, to keep it in house, whatever kind of strategy you want to use to keep it within your family. Uh, for example, you know, my, we were able to purchase the land next door. And the premise was, is to have more dirt, whether it was for cows or whatever. And my son said, you know, I'd like to build a house there. So then me and him sat down and I said, well, I can finance you up to this amount. Do you think you can make that work? And him and his three brothers, they're over there right now uh, building this house and we're keeping that as much as humanly possible within our family, within our system, within our banking system and, and making it work. Uh, and meanwhile, I mean, my son's 19 year old. He doesn't, he barely has any credit. He would never qualify at a bank for a mortgage or probably even like a $50,000 loan or anything like that. And these, when, when we take back, when we take back our dollars, when we take back our time, when we slow down, um, and intentionally live. And it, it, when you're, when you hear somebody like rabble on about this stuff, you're like, that just sounds so foreign and so crazy. Cause it's so different. Um, but really, if you take the time, I always tell my boys observe the masses and do the opposite. I read that in a W Clement stone book, like probably like 20 years ago. And that has been my philosophy. And when you do that in our modern culture, yeah, you look weird. You look weird. You sound weird. Even though when you do speak truth, people are like, you know what he's saying? You know, truth resonates. And they're like, no, that that's true. Like, I can't comprehend all of what he's saying, but I do know that that's true. Um, and as, you know, operations like Tavistock and different things have, have deconstructed society and created this whole rebel mentality. Like the more, now the more people that rebel with the, piercings and the gauges and the tattoos and the hair they all look the same and you know like the social engineers are deconstructing deconstructing western culture and and immigrants who desired that western culture forsook the the culture that they came from that was built around these fundamental things like the family and like uh, sticking together and staying together and working together on a 
uh, communal property because this, you know, because people always want to talk about communism and kibbutzes and all these different things. And we, we know that they don't work historically, but what does work? Well, families working together and saving together and accumulating together and borrowing within their own network. The, these, these things are incredibly practical. They're very doable. None of them are easy. Hey, you know, we're all family. We're all different. Um, you, you can't kill your family, you know, at least that's what I've been told. You can't do that. So, right. So you work together, you, you, you resolve your conflicts and your issues. And by doing all that and taking the time and talking it out, you're not just resolving your problems, but you're creating solutions. And, you know, this is the, the, the past is the solution for the future. And we do need the only way we're going to shatter the technocratic oligarchy and central bank digital currency and all of these technocratic devices that have been designed to enslave us is to not just, it's not enough to ring the bell and reject it, but what are we going to put in its place? And what we can put in its place is what was originally there. We just we can restore these foundational fundamental things like family, like mothers and fathers raising their children together, being a good example for them, um, saving properly, teaching and training them properly, being there, being available, being around. Right. So that when bad stuff happens, because bad stuff's always going to happen. Right. But if you are there. And if you're present and you're aware, you can address the issue. You know, now your kid doesn't need SSRIs and doesn't have like a fractured personality and doesn't have to try to rebuild all this stuff, right? Because they have parents that were present and that were uh, aware and plugged in and paying attention. And yeah, you know what? I mean, what does that mean for me? I don't have hobbies. You know, I do uh, I, I'm very active. I like sports. I like all these things, but, um, you know, and now me and my kids, me and the three older boys will play pickleball and different things like that. So we're, we're not like, we're not like Amish for lack of a better word, you know, like, uh, we do, we do like to relax. We do like to vacation and do all these things. So it's not like, it's not like so puritanical, like you have to totally reject, uh, leisure and all these different things. But at the same time, it requires an inordinate amount of sacrifice because if you're not going to plug into the mon the debt based monetary system, right? You're going to have to use. Um, you're going to have to go without in order to save. You're going to have to go without, right? And you're going to have to capitalize and save money and do these different things. So that means that you're not going to be able to keep up with the the Joneses. You're not going to be ha able to have uh, the two thousand. Uh, 25 F-150 with all of the uh, data package and, and the big monitor and all these different things. But by uh, rejecting that and buying a humble used vehicle that gets the job done for 15 or 20,000, which is so insane to me because it used to be 10 or whatever. But um, if you are just um, more conservative, right? We we have these supposed politicians, right, that are conservative. And I mean, I'm 47 years old and I'm still waiting for one of these conservative politicians to conserve anything. Like they don't, they they aren't capitalists. They, they conserve absolutely nothing. They spend everything and a little bit more. Um, so what's, so what's the onus? So we'll, we'll find one and vote for him. Well, of course not. You know, that, that system is designed to fail and play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Um, but you, but okay. So if I'm conservative, well, what can I do? I can conserve, you know, if, if I, if I say I'm conservative and I believe that, right, that belief will, will manifest itself in my actions. So the only way, if you say you're conservative, the only way that that will be apparent to everyone around you is if you actually conserve something. So I'm a textbook conservative. I would be a historical liberal, I guess, um, where we have to be fiscally responsible. We have to save. We have to capitalize, right? And if we do that, we now have a bank where we can access that bank 
and do these all these things that everybody says, well, that's impossible. You can't do that. In 2024, you can't do that. And that's what we want to continue continue to demonstrate that not only is it possible, it's practical. In my opinion, it's the only way forward. And we want to um, illustrate that to encourage other people. Like one, it's doable. Look, they're still doing it. You know, and, and these people that have been watching us on YouTube for like almost a decade, they're like, yeah, those crazy weirdos, I wonder what they're doing. And then they click on and they're like, whoa, they're still doing it. Like it hasn't, it hasn't crumbled, you know, and we're not, uh, we're not some kind of curated Instagrammy filtered kind of, we, we just like to keep it real. We like to be honest. We like to be transparent. And we, we also don't really want to placate to anyone either. Like we want to be very clear with what we believe and we want to vocalize it. So as to not be dishonest for the sake of creating a uh an appearance of something that we're not um and you know and I, that's why i really appreciate your podcast you have such a variety of different people on um and you're willing to have the conversation i think it's so important as fract as fractured as we've been become as a society by design you know we have to be able to have conversations we have to be able to disagree and then we have to be able to the only way you're the best way to win an argument is to say hey this is my idea this is what i believe this is the way that i want to live and then if you prove that the proofs the proof in the puddings in the eating like once you do that well it works for him like, I don't know if it would work for anybody else, but it's working for them. And now we have that next generation that is implementing and and doing this. And it's it's a proof of concept. And the funny thing is, it's like, this isn't like some kind of like, uh, wow, this is such a new, unique idea. No, no, this is very, truth is very old. Truth is old. Truth is has been around forever. And as the world changes and data and technology and AI and, you know, the truth will still always remain the truth. And if you implement truth, it will produce more truth. And it, and um, a document once said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I do believe the truth is self-evident. And that's basically our premise for why we do what we do. Yeah, I, I think we can learn a lot from the way our ancestors lived. And I think we're, we're learning that the more we or the further we get from our primitive ancestors and, and older civilizations, the the more we learn that they had it right. And we're trying to reinvent the wheel. And maybe the wheel was the best way of, of you know, mm -hmm. of, of, of making something move and, and creating tires for for something. And uh, you see with the way we eat, right? Like uh, I eat a yeah. keto vor diet where it's like, you know, it's keto, but it's, it's most of it's just meat and a little bit of salad from time to time. But like there, I mean, I'll go days in a row where the only thing I will eat is like steak and eggs or pork and bacon or bunless burgers or whatever. And, uh, and consume nothing else besides caffeine and electrolytes to keep me going. And, um, and I feel better and a lot of people feel better doing that. Uh, obviously yeah. Peterson, uh, cured himself of, of many health issues, uh, and his daughter also with the, uh, carnivore diet. I've had Dr. Sean Baker on, I've just had Dr. Dominic Diagostino on for, I think the third time recently and, um, his whole, you know, just story, how he got into keto diet and all the, all the research showing that you can prevent a lot of our health issues by just changing the way we eat and uh there's a great uh app it was funny because i've had it for a while but i just heard it reference on the rogan podcast recently called uh the yoka app i think that's how you pronounce it okay but it's pretty cool it's uh and it's important because i'm trying to change my 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 son not so much because like i say on the podcast kids uh don't do what you say they do what you do and because i eat a yeah. Uh, carnivore-esque diet it's easier to get him to eat that way because he sees me eat that way and I'm still in shape and he sees me play sports or whatever so he's like okay if I want to be an athlete if I want to stay in shape like I should eat more like him and um but my daughter she she likes a snack and she she mm -hmm. she's much pick uh pickier with what she eats so recently to make it kind of fun 
and, and a bit scary. Also, what we uh, I had her um, use the Yuka app to scan the things that she eats and drinks. And what it'll do is, and I don't necessarily agree with it in regards to because um, it kind of still has some of that. Uh, like traditional dietary recommendations of like, oh, you shouldn't consume too much sodium and you shouldn't consume too much fat. But what it, it's really good with is telling you all the additives and preservatives that are in there. So you'll scan something and it'll give you the, uh, the how many, it'll tell you if it's good, bad, or excellent, whatever. And then you scan it and then you can uh, click on preservatives that are in it and it'll give you a, a explanation on what that preservative is preservative is what it's used for and why it's hazardous and you know it's so it's it's really good so it's like okay you're eating stuff every single day as a snack that has hazardous preservatives in there that can be harmful and you know and we know it can be harmful and um and then the cool thing too is that it'll give you recommendations too so it'll give you like healthier recommendations you know to that food or that snack or that whatever uh so but it's funny because one thing that we scanned that was just kind of just for the heck of it. I didn't think it was going to come up as bad. Um, was uh, element? I think it was uh, not element. Um, it was a a a, a water that had electrolytes in it, like uh, for flavor. And uh, and it was just it looks like water. It tastes like water. I forget which one it it is. Uh, obviously it's not element electrolytes. I'm a huge fan of element electrolytes, and they don't have any preservatives in their products, but. It had something in there that like was bad for you. And I'm just like, you can't even get some of this, what's supposed to be like enhanced better water without having, you know, some type of preserve preservative in there that's going to be uh, harmful. So it's like, you got to be so cautious with what you eat. Yeah. Another thing too, is because we have a very big Polish and Portuguese and immigrant community in this area where, where I live you can go to butcher shops and you can go to little Portuguese markets and buy products right from Portugal. And, um, these products come in and you'll scan them. And the, the product that looks ju just like the American product will be uh, much better for you. The European version of it, just because it doesn't have all those extra chemicals that are apparently completely okay for Americans to consume. So, you know, my point is like there there is a a lot of what we're doing now that's wrong and we need to, to kind of learn from the wisdom of our ancestors you know i've talked a lot about also uh the knees over toes guy um mm -hmm. he, he uh he trained and fixed a lot of his health issues and a lot of people's health issues by uh training knees over toes and it sounds silly but this idea that like i think nike was the first shoe company to start putting cushing uh, in the heels. So what it did, it caused us to, uh, to run and walk incorrectly. Cause if we're barefoot, you'd always be on the ball of your feet. You wouldn't be able to jump or walk or run on your heel. And anytime you have a mechanical, um, uh, issue where it, like something, you know, mechanically isn't right. It can cause other issues like hip issues and ankle issues or whatever. And, um, so this idea of like training knees over toes makes perfect sense because a lot of people, when they work out, they, they squat, flat-footed and it's like okay well yeah. when would i ever be flat-footed uh like this it's basically only when i'm squatting like i'm not recreating actual movement where if i'm training knees over toes that strength and 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 putting that friction on my joints in that uh, mechanical way is strengthening those joints and strengthening those muscles in the correct manner where when i am running or jumping or doing something uh in the natural world i'm i'm recreating that natural movement so it's like that's just one of, of many examples like the way we eat the way we move um you know i remember rogan years ago having uh that lady who slept on the floor like she didn't believe in like beds <laughs> you know that type of thing <laughs> um, yeah you know, and, and which i'm like i'm thinking about it, i'm like that kind of makes sense i can see how our bodies are almost designed to be you know sleeping on the floor you know so uh it, yeah so all that stuff is, is fascinating um with schooling same thing right like it's like uh, one of my favorite quotes and i i repeat it all the time is school got in the way of my learning and it's it i, I always felt like that i'm like this i i've always been anti-homework i mean i, I was anti-homework in school because i didn't want to do Me it too. But, and yeah and uh and i've i've never liked school and at, with, even with my kids i'm like and I explained to him, I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm an open book and I like to have uh, honest communication and dialogue with my kids. I'm like, listen, 
if the teacher can't get you to understand this thing, six they have six hours out of your day. You're awake for how many hours? Like mm -hmm. six hours is devoted to going to the school where you have very little control over what you're learning or how you're learning it or whatever. Um, now you're out. You finally have some time to explore other hobbies, other things, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. And this, you know, this idea that now you have to do homework. And then by the way, like, parents help the kids with the homework so the teachers get the homework graded don't even know if the kids actually have an issue understanding this because the parents most likely help them do it so it's like if the, how do you like you're literally just saying like hey i want all your free time and you have yep. no, you know which is insane i'm um i've talked about this in the past about uh the power of um just downtime right like having time to like reflect and think and having time to to the ponder and mm -hmm. and just you know sometimes that's when when your best ideas come right it's yeah. you're, you're in the shower you're going for a walk you're by yourself or like uh, i like when between my sets when i'm working out like just kind of thinking to myself or whatever and uh we're, we're literally telling people not to do that and i think yeah. covid that's why a lot of people snapped out of it a little bit because they were so especially in the east coast i mean Pennsylvania is probably not uh, very different than Massachusetts in regards to everybody's fast pace, fast pace, fast pace. And it's like, you never even have time to think about like, what am I doing with my life? Am I really happy? Am I really just, do I even want to go down this road or am I being pushed or, and, and suggested to go down this road? So like all these things and it's like, and then COVID, like everybody was forced to pump the brakes and they're like, huh, one maybe I don't really like that person I live with. I mean, how many divorces came after COVID because they're like, Hey, we get along because we were never together. <laughs> now that we're, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we realize we don't really get along that much. And, um, and then there's just a lot of people who, who had time to like kind of re-examine their lives. Like maybe I need to spend more time with my family. Maybe like you said that, that expensive truck. Yeah. It's really nice, but it comes with a sacrifice and that sacrifice is the one thing you can't buy. And that's time. Yeah. Once it's gone, yeah. it's gone. And, uh, so I, th I I think there's all so much benefit in living the way that you guys live. I do want to get into like because all this sounds very harmless. Why would you guys be censored on YouTube? Well, uh, it it started out with medical misinformation, and then what they actually did is they went back in older videos that were prior to the medical misinformation censorship they went back to like a 2016 video where i said something about vaccines which current which obviously wasn't referring to anything post 2016 and then they retroactively made that um against you know the who guidelines and i'm like well wait a minute the who guidelines didn't even exist when i said that you know and it wasn't related to the current thing or whatever um but yeah it, it just started out like that it was so insane um our channel grew real slow and we got to like thirty thousand subs and in like 20 20 we're at like 20 20 21 we we're at thirty thousand subs and then something happened during COVID and our channel went from 30,000 subs to 100,000 subs. And we were doing a lot of videos because at that time, my oldest son, my oldest son said, uh, hey, I think I want to do this as a business, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it, right? So he started doing lots of videos and he's very skilled with his editing and different things. And um, our channel went from 30,000 to 100,000 but then we really started getting the strikes and we got like a strike for um, uh, he was when he was little. One of our older videos, he was demonstrating like a Bowie knife and he wasn't even using it. He was just talking about it as a tool and that got flagged. And it, it was it's just it's so insane. The frustrating part of trying to do something online with all this technocracy is they clearly hate all of us and they hate the truth and they absolutely hate reality. And so, and we, you know, when they started this and it was just this, like when, when my son said, I want to do this as a business and I'm like, Hey man, this is like in you know, like it, you know, we will get, we will get censored. It's, it's not if it's when, and it's to what magnitude. Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So when the, when the, 
when the YouTube channel exploded, we simultaneously launched a website where we started selling stuff. And um, that did when the YouTube channel was exploding, that the website was exploding simultaneously. And then uh, we had three really great months with a lot of ad revenue and a lot of website sales. And then they virtually, they almost vaporized this and we went like almost extinct, like we didn't exist and everything stopped. But that particular um, time frame, uh, they were able to, to capitalize their business. So they took all those dollars and they bought like a mobile sawmill and they started a small handyman business. And now that has grown. And um, so even though we're still trying to, uh, and, and we, we've had so many crazy things. So our previous website was a Squarespace website that we managed ourselves. And about eight months ago, we got debanked by Stripe, who's the only credit card processor on there for some unbeknown reason. And so we had to pay to have a new website built with a new card processor and we did it on WordPress. So that's more standalone. Um, and so it's, it's just like trying to, trying to interact online. Um, we got debanked by Stripe on our website. And then we, we had certain things we had like courses and memberships and that all got vaporized when Stripe debanked us. Cause what they do is if you have any recurring income, they cancel it. So um, we're still trying to rebuild. We just relaunched the new website. Um, we're, we're just launching a brand new coffee line with, with a local roaster. And then our most popular, we do have a micro roast. We have a um, CBD coffee. The hemp is grown locally by uh, a, a awesome 150 year old uh, homestead here. Uh, it's a multi-generational black family. They do all the hemp. And then we have a micro roaster in Longview and he roasts. So we have like really kind of cool niche stuff that has performed very well. Uh, when people, when we can process people's payments and people can get to the website, like the Squarespace website, they started jacking with it and it wouldn't even like you would click on stuff. It wouldn't work. It it's kind of insane. And, and people say, you know, you just sound really paranoid, but when everything's going smooth and you can look at all the data and everything's going great and then everything stops and then you try to tweak it and adjust it and it just continues to like tank it's, it's, you know, it's new challenges. We roll with it. And, uh, but yeah, just this, this technocratic censorship over completely arbitrary. The hilarious thing about YouTube is so exclusively arbitrary. We've been demonetized now on YouTube, uh, for however many months, three or four months now. And we got a warning for animal cruelty and the, the short that got flagged was, my son supposedly squishing a spider, but there was no video evidence that he squished a spider. And so I get sent a notice and they are like, this is cruelty to animals. So we're taking it down. And I said, well, one, a spider is not an animal. It's an insect, you know, unless it's identifying as an animal and I'm not aware of it. Um, it's an insect. And two, there is no video evidence of anything being harmed you know so now we're like demonetized and you know and we we've tried like doing different things on rumble and it's just it's it's just another limited hangout it's so uh throttled and brutal um but so this is what's bled into the podcast so um and that's i appreciate what you do i've already had like a couple like i had chris emery on and i had aw finnegan on and i heard about both of those guys from your podcast and so our intention was hey let's um let's launch a podcast maybe we can circumvent su uh, some of the censorship and just become a little bit more ubiquitous and a little bit of backstory on all of this while my kids were building this business and doing this um, I had developed a, a shoulder condition and, and I didn't know it at the time. I had these issues in my neck and in my back and it was, it was emanating from my shoulder. I thought like my neck and back, upper back were destroyed. I was very active six days a week in the gym, kettlebells and heavy stuff, you know? Um, and I love that. Um, but, uh, come to find out I was from some like arthritic condition and nobody knows the 
what was what started it. It could have just been a genetic uh, birth defect or whatever. But now I'm missing like 30 to 40 percent of my labrum. I had my shoulder cleaned out. I had four orthopedic surgeons told me I needed a shoulder replacement. So because of all that, I had it cleaned up. Then I went to a stem scare, a stem cell specialist in Dallas, Donnie Buford, and I did some therapeutic. He sucked out my bone marrow, spun it, and then he uh, strategically injected it back into my shoulder. That took away my pain. Um, I am, man, I tell everybody about stem cells. They are legit as long as they're your stem cells and they're real and they're not like cryo and trying to wake them back up and all that stuff because I don't think that stuff works. But So I got stem cells and I had a lot of, all my pain went away, but with the missing labrum and stuff, um, I still had loss of range of motion. So that's when we implemented carnivore probably about 14 or 15 months ago. And now I'm back doing push-ups uh, today. So when they clean my shoulder, I had to get a bicep tendinesis. So they take your bicep, bicipital tendon, they, they cut it off of your shoulder and they pin it down here um, on your upper arm somewhere. And it takes a really long time to recover from that. Um, just in the past couple of weeks, I've been able to start doing, uh, curls again, uh, well, like 20, 20, 30 pounds. And, uh, today I bought some of these like, um, all in one dumbbells, you spin the knob and it has, it goes from like five pounds to like 55 pounds. And I always thought the, they were kind of like, uh, cheesy kind of like marketing things, but because of my diminished capacity, um, I, I keep trying to invent ways. Like I can't just go in the gym and crush it anymore. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy some of these. And so I, today I started doing squ dumbbell squats and, uh, it's so weird, especially for people that aren't into working out and whatever. But today I had that first like large muscle movement, like pump euphoria kind of thing that I haven't had in like three years. And I was like, wow, I, I thought that I was going to have to like do without this, but like, and it's so good for regu regulating your blood sugar and all these other things. And I, I was really missing and improving your sleep and all these other things. But uh, yeah, so started carnivore about 15 months ago, started doing push-ups maybe about almost immediately, um, but still like lots of loss of range of motion. I still can't, I certainly can't shoulder press or anything with this arm. Um, but continuing to improve, um, continuing to remain pain-free, uh, I definitely have to stay very strict carnivore. Whenever I deviate or cheat, I feel it almost immediately. Um, but uh, I do want to encourage people to research carnivore or ketovore, whatever. Um, it is a healing modality that will uh, th within two weeks, you're going to feel a benefit. And if you are, if you can maintain it in any way and be honest about it, uh, it it's been a, our, we're a family of eight and we're all eating almost exclusively a meat fat based diet. And it, it has systematically resolved everybody's health issues. Even this new current, um, cold and flu virus that goes around like every three months and continues to um, be this like endless cycle of sickness. We've been able to completely break and shatter that. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's different. It's challenging. Um, and it's a different way of thinking. Uh, I use a, I use an app called carb manager and that's made a big difference because one of my things on carnivore, I had a ton of success and then I'm just like, huh, I just really don't feel good anymore. And come to find out, I was just under eating because where I was so satiated and I wasn't hungry and I was eating one meal a day and I was only ended up eating like, and I wasn't working out. Like if I was working out, I think it would have, it would have adjusted itself because I would have known I needed it. But where I wasn't working out, I, I was under eating and I just wasn't getting any of the positive benefits of doing that. Um, my main, my inflammation was staying away, but I just, I felt tired. I wasn't sleeping good, but it was all because I just wasn't eating enough protein and fat. So I use carb manager. I started doing that. And, and now, yeah, today I did some dumbbell squats with like 55 pounders and, uh, feel great. And so I'm going to start to get to exercise again. And I'm re I'm really looking forward to that. And, and I'm, and I'm curious, I want to go back to my stem cell therapist 
maybe get some new x-rays and sonograms because I, I had um dr anthony chafee on he was a and i had sean baker on too and we were talking about like joint regeneration and i know that a lot of guys say that that's not probably not possible but i hear other people's testimonies and stories where they're supplementing with glucosamine and doing like um carnivore type or ketovore type diets and they are seeing like massive improvements in their knees and in their hips so i'm still kind of holding out hope that i can regenerate this shoulder at least if i can build the muscles back up to where they need to be maybe i could return to a more real uh functionality of the shoulder but uh yeah it's been quite a quite a road but we're 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 progressing and advancing which um the reason i brought this up is when my son decided to start this youtube business you know i was at the point where i thought i had to retire i was almost de dehabilitated like i i thought i couldn't work and i was i wasn't sleeping and i was sucking it up and scraping it together enough to go into work and produce but i'm like long term I can't, I can't carry a ladder. I can't do these things. I can't get on the buildings. I can't, I certainly can't do any type of labor. And so when they were rolling this out and they were like, wow, dad, you know what? We're making enough revenue that we could retire you and you could work with us and we could just do this thing. And then it all got shut down, you know? And it was like, man, they work so hard and they build it up. And I mean, lucrative and profitable, what, I mean, it was way beyond our expectations and then to have three months of success and then for it to literally get turned off. That's why anybody that suffers from any type of censorship, you know, when you can, when you can sympathize with them, when, you, yeah, I know what that feels like, man, that is like, you work so hard, you have all these great ideas and people want what you have to offer and the market wants it. But then the technocrats just turn the switch off and it's because of some arbitrary thing. Oh, well, sorry, you squished a spider, you know, and it's like, wow, yeah, thanks, you know. And uh, so that that's kind of what fostered this podcast. And now, thankfully, uh, physically and um, health wise, I'm feeling great. I'm, I'm back over producing at work and doing everything there. So thank the Lord. I don't think that I have to physically retire at 47 which i didn't ever quite know how that was going to actually happen or work but thanks to uh the grace of god and just a, a change of the diet that you know all these different things you talked about knees over toes and just looking at the ingredients on a packaging think of how simple that is right you have two you have two products right and you can I, i'll give you a great illustration go to your grocery store right now and get two things of heavy cream and probably get the store brand and look at it and then get a cleaner brand. And hopefully your store brand is cleaner, but ours isn't right. And you'll see heavy cream and it'll be like, there'll be like eight ingredients and it'll have carrageenan and it'll have some kind of sorbate, whatever preservative. And then if you get a better brand, it's like, Oh, milk and cream. And you're like, well, yeah, that's what it should say. And they've been selling refrigerated, ultra pasteurized which if i could get it and i can get it raw we have several raw dairies but i'm just you know the other thing is is like you don't have to do everything like i could go buy the raw stuff right from the and i would prefer to do that but right now where we are i buy it at our local grocery store and if you just look at those ingredients and like okay this is 50 cents more but this is actually clean if as long as they're being honest on the label right and you just make that one decision like well I'm going to buy the clean one. It's 50 cents more. It's not going to break the bank. And wow. Or, hey, when I do squats, instead of standing flat-footed, I'm just going to, I'm going to go up on my toes, right? And you're still doing a squat. You're still working out. You're doing all the same things. But it's just this tiny adjustment that makes all the difference, right? And, and that's just like, and when you think about that, about every aspect of your life, and if you slow down, and have the time to meditate on it, to think about it, to muse about it, right? And you're like, well, wow, what if I just made this subtle change, right? And things, when you do that, things open up, you uh, progress. And that's just like every aspect of your life. You can do that with your diet. You can do that with your 
your physicality. You can do that um, spiritually, you know, whether it's uh, reading the word and prayer and meditating and doing all these different things. Like if you take, if you take that one small idea and apply it to every aspect of your life, like incredible things can happen. And it, it doesn't, it's not like, well, you have to sell all of your stuff and move 2000 miles to the middle of nowhere where you don't know anybody and, you know, uh, explore for gold or oil or whatever, you know, it's not like that. It's these really small, it's these small, menial, almost insignificant changes that you make to your life and you try fail adjust. And you're like, well, I tried that. That doesn't work. Well, you know, I get that all the time on our channel. Like, well, I tried carnivore and it doesn't work. Well, did you really, did you do it for real? Like, did you commit to it for two weeks and do it for real and be honest about it? Or did you, well, I'm going to eat all the same. I'm going to eat chips all day and I'm going to have a steak for dinner. And, you know, and I don't know why my arteries clog shut and all this stuff. Well, you know, cause you, you didn't, you didn't commit to it. You didn't give it an honest effort. And that, you know, all these little tiny changes that you can do in your life can have this butterfly effect, can have this huge tsunami type of effect over a decade. It, it's fascinating for me to look. It's so surreal. You know, when we moved, my oldest son was nine, you know, he's 19, right? And it's weird watching him build that house over there. I mean, that's weird, man. That's weird. And, and here we are, you know, 10 years ago, we moved, uh, we had just enough money to buy the, our broken down fixer upper house, you know, and it was on five acres. And in the past 10 years, we've been able to, by the grace of God, we've been able to accumulate about 50 acres. You know, we've done, we're completely debt free. We cash flowed all of it. And now he's building his house. Uh, he's 19. He doesn't have a credit. He didn't go to the bank, you know, and we're doing this. And it's just an illustration that you can do it. You can't do it overnight. We couldn't do it year one. We couldn't do it year nine. You know, it had to happen in year 10 and it, and it's happening and we're watching it. And th there's no, um, there's nothing spooky or mystical about it or, uh, we got lucky or we got uh, this break here or there or anything. Um, it was just making these tiny tweaks and changes, changing your, you know, the way you hold your feet when you squat, uh, turning around the package and looking at the ingredients and just making a, making a choice here. One, being educated to know that you shouldn't be drinking carrageenan in heavy cream and that carrageenan shouldn't be in heavy cream. And why is carrageenan in heavy cream? It's it's those small tiny decisions every day that accumulate that pay off like e exponentially in the long run. Yeah, I remember Mark Bell when he was on the show years ago. He uh he talked about like the five minute walk thing and how I, I can't remember if it was before or after he ate, but he would go on like a five minute walk and this dude's huge and he's jacked and huge. it was just this idea of like hey. It doesn't, it's not hard. It takes five minutes, but just start there, go for a five minute walk. And then that will hopefully open the door to like, Hey, you know, like I actually feel better when I'm outside breathing in air, I'm moving my body. And I think that's the other thing about farmers too. And, you know, I talked about going back to Portugal and everybody seemed to be happier and whatnot. I think a part of it was one, like the simple, like you said, simple things, like they're eating things that you can pick, things you can grow and things you can kill. You know, um, I remember years ago, I had this uh, uh, health and fitness uh, expert, uh, Andrea Lowell, and she's like, um, if there's ingredients, don't eat it. And I'm just like thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of, it sounds extreme, but when you, it's carnivore diet sounds extreme too, right? But, and then when you really, yeah, yeah. It, you're like, you're like, no, that actually makes perfect sense. Like if it has ingredients, don't eat it. Like app, a apple doesn't have ingredients, you know, like a piece of steak doesn't have ingredients. Like a, a egg doesn't like it. Water doesn't have ingredients. So it's like, yeah, that's kind of simple. Like, and if you want to make anything, you have the ingredients, you buy the raw ingredients and then you, you mix it yourself. Right. And, um, yeah. you know, and even with like local butcher shops, local, uh, bakeries, you buy stuff there. It doesn't last that long. But if I go buy yeah. a local grocery store, you know, the, but the loaf of bread can sit on the counter for, you know, weeks and, you know, and it's fine. And, and so th those are the questions people don't ask like, Hey, 
why is this bread lasting so long? And um, and also, you know, the lifestyle that we live today of being in front of a, a computer, um, being detached physically uh, from others uh, and not being around people where you're having like physical interactions and and you're you know, and you're also detached from nature. For, for example, like being in the backyard of my parents' house because they have goats and chickens and and woods and and it's just something peaceful. I you know when uh, with sports it's hard, but um, when we do have time to have like uh, Sunday lunches that turn into dinners at my parents' house, it's an all day event. We uh, you know I'll, I like to sit in the backyard sometimes, get away from everybody, and just like be be there and have a. Um, you know, a, 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 a glass of wine or a cigar or a, some whiskey and just sit there. And I'm like, I don't know what it is. There's something so peaceful about this. And I, I think that's the thing about farmers and people who work with their hands, like a body in motion stays in motion. I always say like you get a car and you put it in a garage and you store it. Once you start it up in 20 years, you're going to have tons of issues. Why? Because that car was engineered and designed to move or so was our body. And if you don't move, it breaks down just like that car. And we need to keep moving. A body motion stays in motion. So I think there's so many things that we we have wrong and maybe we had right at some time. And now, you know, we've been pushed in this direction because, you know, everybody's looking to, uh, you know, just give us cheaper food and, and more, uh, you know, just the, pushing these lifestyles on us, not because they're better, but because financially they, they might be better for a co corporation or whatnot. So there, yeah, I mean, we, we, we can learn a lot. And that's why I, I love people like Jack Cruz, Dr. Jack Cruz. He's another guy who, who I love because his, he emphasized so much about um, the sun. And I, I, I think there's, you know, we're all vitamin D deficient just about, uh, I, people are always like, how do you tan? I'm like, because I, I do my best of like anytime there's a little bit of sunlight, I will do my best to find a way to be outside. I will take my laptop if I have to do, um, you know, office work. I'll take my laptop, get up, go outside. I'll, uh, when I'm, you know, if we have free time and the kids, uh, even before or after soccer practice, like, hey, it's still nice out. Let's go for a walk. Let's go play a little bit more. Let's go to the park. Let's do something and try to soak it in. Cause I just feel better when I'm in the sun. I feel better when when you know um, i'm outside and yeah know, there's so many other and that's the thing like there's all these little life changes that can go a long way like you said you know be just you know be cautious of like what you're putting on your skin what you're wearing what you're breathing what you know um you know what you're eating uh how how little active you are you know maybe just doing a, a five minute walk maybe just um you know doing yoga or doing um, Zumba, it's something, you know, even if it does, it doesn't seem that hard or that difficult, like just doing it once or twice a week, will will show you the benefits and, and you'll feel the, the benefits mentally and physically of, you know, how much better you feel when you're, you're active and moving your body and getting your heart rate up and, and all these things. And, uh, I just think we, we live such unnatural lives and, uh, and that really is a culprit for so many of our issues when it's physically and mentally, and we never get to the root cause of the issue. And something I've been saying on the show uh, a lot lately, it's like, you know, can we stop talking about why is healthcare so expensive and start talking about why do we need so much healthcare? Why do we need to be on a pill? Why does everybody need uh, multiple prescription drugs? Why do people need to be checked? Yeah and double checked and go to these uh checkups all the time like well, why why are people having all these health issues and instead of like trying to get a pill for that symptom let's figure out why we have so many symptoms and um you know and i think going back to the way we used to live will fix a lot of that and that's why i think carnivore is so powerful uh, a little antidote about the sun and vitamin d deficiency you know i i was never um sensitive to the sun, but being in Texas and being in construction and being on flat roofs and now these new highly reflective flat roofs, um, I would get roasted, you know, and, and totally torched, uh, since going carnivore, I cannot sunburn. I cannot, I could, I could be in direct sun eight to 12 hours a day. I've tried. Okay. I've tried. Um, you know, we have a small farm here and I'm on the farm on Fridays and uh, I will work outside all day. I have about 400 fruit trees. So I'm always pruning and doing all that kind of stuff with that. And uh, 
I cannot sunburn. And so what does that tell you? That tells you somebody was lying somewhere about something because um, one, you got to slather these seed oils and these uh, derivatives and these like 150 ingredient things on your skin to block the sun because you're going to get skin cancer. Well, now I don't even burn. So I don't need that stuff. And uh, two, when you change your diet, right, and you have these maladies and they go away, you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, my my rheumatoid arthritis wasn't because I didn't have enough uh, my daily dose of Vioxx, right? It was because there was something going wrong. And so what that does is that changes your your paradigm and your mentality to where, and I I was told all these things, we learned all these things. And in reality, it, this isn't reality. And if we make these minor adjustments, like we don't need, you don't need a uh, suntan lotion or sunscreen or whatever. And then by not using those things and not burning, and then you are getting your optimum, optimum uh, D vitamin, right? And now you have ele elevated serotonin levels. You have a more pleasant mood, right? You're out of pain and it just, it just all synergistically works together. And it's, it's about observing the masses and doing the opposite, you know, and that's, what's beautiful about carnivore is you can try it for two weeks. Anybody can do anything for two weeks. So try it for two weeks and see if it works. Everybody that I've had try it and everybody that I've interviewed, every single one has always said within the first two weeks, I started sleeping better. I stopped snoring. Um, I had better, better mental clarity. One huge thing for me is I, I heard a lot of people talk about brain fog. I had no, I'm like, well, I didn't know that I had brain fog until it went away. And then once it went away, I was just like, oh, wow, that's what brain fog is because now I don't have it. I can remember all the words I want to say. I don't remember them like six hours later. And what was I going to do? I just went in that room and I was going to do something. And I don't know why I went in there, you know, and we chalk all these things up, like all of my neck and my back and my shoulder and my brain fog. I I'm like, wow, getting old is terrible. I'm like, I guess this is what I thought 50 was the new 30 and I'm not even there yet. And I feel like I'm 80, you know what I mean? And all it was, was a dietary change. I didn't, I didn't need some new supplement. I didn't need some new pharmaceutical. It was just a change a very minor change in diet that has just been um, just a huge blessing for our family. It's been great. Without a doubt. And these are the things that people are going to learn on your podcast. They're going to hear more about, they're going to hear more or see some of this on your YouTube channel. And, uh, and you're right. I mean, the, the thing about the YouTube channel, I, I went through a very similar thing where I didn't want to self-censor uh, during COVID. I was getting strikes. And then I had Dr. Peter McCullough on Dr. Robert Malone mm. and my subscriptions were blowing up and my views were blowing up because I think people were, were looking for that information. And then, uh, they kind of pumped the brakes and, and completely, you know, deleted my whole channel. And, um, so it, it just, it's not a free market. Right. And I think that's yeah. kind of what we're saying. And I think that's the frustrating part. It's like, it's not that I'm not putting out, you know, valuable information or something that even if it's just entertaining information, stuff that people enjoy listening to help them get uh, by, you know, whatever eight hour job they're doing um, on a daily basis, but people can't even get it anymore. And you're not recommending yeah. it anymore. You're suppressing it. And so it's not about like, okay, let the best podcast win or the, let the best YouTube channel win. It's all about like, Hey, you know, um, if you're, doing anything against the grain or anything that we might not like, or you, your narratives don't uh, fall with our nar narratives or push back on our narratives, then we're going to suppress you. And it's not about yeah. how good or bad your content is or any of that stuff. And that's, that's the thing that sucks. I remember when I had Adam Curry on not too long ago before we started recording, he's like, he's like, yeah, you, you know, um, something about like, um, uh, doing the podcast full time. And I'm like, no, I don't do the podcast full time. He's like, Oh really? And I, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, maybe I would be right now if uh, if YouTube didn't censor me and iTunes didn't, sure. uh, didn't censor me because uh, I had issues with them, too, during uh, COVID. But uh, yeah, and who knows what other stuff. And that's just the stuff that that's obvious and we're aware of. I mean, there's plenty of 
other i know everybody says they're shadow banned you know and that is true like i do i do get sure. it like maybe maybe they're just shows that suck out there and need to keep right <laughs> shadow banned, you know? like, <laughs> just sucks i mean i'm not trying to be there it is it is possible that maybe your show just isn't you know maybe there's not but when the uh, the ones that i think are obvious and you can't really dispute that are shadow banned are the ones like yourself and and like what happened with me on youtube and itunes where like numbers were were going up drastically and then all of a sudden boom somebody stopped it you're right and yeah. I, I see it even now with I, I just joined tiktok because people kept saying like just use it because there's people out there using tiktok to get information be exposed to um new information so i'm like why not so start uploading stuff and even you know i'll see a video get to like you know a thousand views in like a minute you know and then next thing you know it just stops and i'm like what just that happened is. yeah yeah you no know, so it's like something is going on here and uh and it and it and it sucks it's not fair because there there are people who are putting in a lot of work like yourself into and, and your kids who are putting in a lot of work into editing i mean your videos are awesome uh the content's awesome uh there's no reason why you know you don't deserve to be suggested and pushed, you know, onto the public and, um, you know, and it's just, it's not a fair market and, and it sucks, you know, and, uh, but for people out there who want to get in touch with, uh, you will get the channel. I'll put all these links, of course, in the show description. Uh, we definitely need to chat more cause I think we barely scratch the surface on all the topics we can uh, dive deep into, but for people who want to keep up with everything you're doing what's the best spots if you have any upcoming shows uh i know you've had you've said a couple of great guests that you've had on but i know you also had david knight on i know scott's been on your show um but any upcoming guests that you have any upcoming anything that you want to promote and tell people about please let them know so you can find us at the texasboys.com that's our web store and you'll find the youtube channel and the fearless podcast there uh the fearless podcast is on all your podcatchers um we do i i think i have joel salton coming on this week and next week i have dane wigington coming on so i'm pretty pumped about that um, it's, it's a challenge when you're this small trying to network and, and get people on, but, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of great interviews coming up and, um, and then, yeah, you, uh, we, on the, on YouTube, we are the Texas boys on rumble. We're the Texas boys and you can, we have a newsletter, so you can sign up for um, our newsletter on our website. We do sell, uh, beef and pork locally. So if you're in, you're in the Northeast Texas area and that's something you're looking for. We are launching this brand new uh, coffee line and I kind of pre-launched it early cause we had to redo the website and everything. Um, but I'm hammering out all the specifics on that hopefully by the end of today. And uh, that's where you can find us. Uh, Ricky, man, this has been awesome. I'd love to come back on. Uh, I'd love to have you on uh, the fearless podcast. This has been, uh, this has been great. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come on and uh, hopefully we can get you on uh, the Union of the Unwanted one of these uh, upcoming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. Yep.